good morning for me and Professor Pescia here in New Haven and good evening to those of you guys joining us from China and hello from everybody else around the world. Uh, good to see everybody. Um, actually, I can't see everybody because people don't have their cameras on. Uh, and so that would be the first thing I'd ask is um, that if people are able to, to turn on their cameras um, so that when we do begin with our uh, talk that uh, we're not just staring at a black screen, that would be great. Uh, my name is Devin Lau and I am the Assistant Director of Yale Center Beijing. Um, for many of you guys that have been joining us throughout the last uh, year and a half now, uh, you'll know that we at Yale Center Beijing have been hosting talks um, from professors throughout Yale University who have uh, contributed to various fields of research. Um, and today we are very lucky to have Professor Jordan Pecha join us. Um, he is uh, speaking to us about addressing human health problems through microbial genetics and quantitative environmental science. Um, and this is something that uh, we've uh, so, so actually had to uh, deal with quite personally um, here uh, in New Haven as well as around the world um, is actually uh, seeing how his research has been applied um, to the real world. So Professor Jordan Pecha is the Thomas E. Golden Jr. Professor of Environmental Engineering at Yale. His research integrates microbiology, genetics, engineering, data science, and public health to study important environmental problems uh, including human health impacts, water-based epidemiology, and biological control of global methane emission. Um, and like I mentioned, uh, his research has had very direct implications on how we in New Haven and in Connecticut, um, but also elsewhere, um, have been impacted um, by uh, um, <clears throat> COVID, of course, but he's had a very interesting uh, perspective on that, um, which I'm sure he'll talk about today. Um, he's a member of the Connecticut Academy of Sciences and Engineering, as well as the associate editor for the journal Indoor Air and the founding chair of the Gordon Conference on Microbiology of the Built Environment. Uh, so today we are very lucky to have him uh, join us. Um, so the format will be about a 20 to 30 minute talk and then we'll open it up um, to questions from the audience. So if you do have questions, please um, get ready to ask them either um, via the chat function uh, or uh, during the Q&A session, I will call on people directly. Um, and again, once again, welcome. And if you are able to, please turn on your video cameras um, as a way to uh, make this a more lively and um, personal interaction. And with that, I will turn it over to Professor Pecia. Thanks very much, Devin, for that kind introduction. Um, I'm going to share my screen here and get started. So Devin correctly uh, listed the title of my presentation, or certainly the title I gave to you, but I was thinking more about it and I thought, you know, this is kind of what I really want to talk about. So I, I'm interested in solving environmental problems and, and uh, we use the normal channels in, in my lab that are available and traditional to environmental engineers, uh, but we also throw biotechnology into the mix and because of that integration of those two different sciences, we can take on just a broad variety of problems, always with the eye towards solving problems. Um, and I also wanna convince you to get a dog and that's gonna be the uh, second part of my talk. Somehow this is all gonna to come together. All right, so some things that are going on in my lab right now is, you know, we genetically engineer cyanobacteria. This is cyanobacteria growing here, and we've modified them so much to put all of their energy and CO2 into the production of lipids that we can get flocks of lipids that float into a container. This is, of course, for efficient biofuels production. So that's an example of taking a reactor, genetic modification, optimizing the reactor conditions, and being able to grow um, bacteria in a, in a way to get them to do things for us that we wouldn't normally, um, or what they wouldn't normally want to do. The second thing that goes along with process engineering is I know we're all concerned about climate change. One of the largest um, natural emissions of climate gases is methane, and it's methane from wetlands. And that's increasing as permafrost uh, melts and also as the temperatures warm and microbial activity in the earth uh, heats up. And so we're doing a lot of fundamental studies in wetlands right now on the microbial populations that produce and degrade methane um, to try and figure out ways to slow that down. 
The other thing we do in our lab is we look at human waste and we look at infectious disease and the nexus between those two. And then the final thing is, is we think a lot about buildings and, and truthfully, you know, buildings are our environment. They're my environment and I'm sure that they're your environment. They're even my dog's environment. We spend 90% of our time in our buildings and uh, the largest energy expenditure in the United States, 40% of all of our energy goes into buildings. And of course, the contaminants that we're exposed to in buildings are different than those that we're exposed to outdoor air. And they are typically worse and at higher concentrations inside buildings. Our environmental exposures, and if you care about environmental contamination, it's really in buildings. Outdoor, of course, is important, but buildings is where it comes to the, to the fore. So let's start out with just taking two of these topics on, human waste, infectious disease, and then the second one is gonna be more about buildings. So I did wanna talk a little bit about COVID because um, we're actually not finishing this up. I know that COVID is slowing down in a lot of places, but of course for us, um, some of this stuff is just getting going because we're still living in this world of monitoring. And that we worked out in early March, 2020, when SARS-CoV-2 infections started increasing in New Haven, Connecticut, um, with others that one way to efficiently monitor this is to monitor the virus in wastewater. That's because we have spent billions of dollars in infrastructure to connect all of our homes and our businesses and offices to a wastewater treatment plant. When we are sick, SARS-CoV-2 ends up in our stool and that ends up in a wastewater treatment plant. And we thought that if we wanted to detect its presence in the city, we could find it most efficiently in the treatment plant, but also we could maybe get some ideas about what the infection rate are. And so that come, turns out to be true. This is um, COVID-19 clinical cases in this first outbreak in Connecticut, this top line here, this bottom line, which mirrors it in shape, is the concentration of SARS-CoV-2 in New Haven's wastewater treatment plant over that time. You can see a pretty clear relationship. In fact, the relationship is better than what you would get from testing. So wastewater surveillance doesn't care about the, the same things that we care about in testing. They don't care if you're asymptomatic or not. If you're sick, you shed. It doesn't matter whether you go get tested or not. It doesn't matter about whether you wanna get tested on a holiday, whether the government can afford you testing, whether there are resources, doesn't care about any of that stuff, whether it's cold out that day. Um, these all affect the testing data, but they don't affect wastewater data because we all, you know, use the toilet um, at, a, at, a pre at, at a common rate. So this is what testing looked like. This is a first wave in New Haven, Connecticut. This is that second big wave, and this is the what we call the, the British variant, the B117 wave that was driven by um, a more infectious variant. But what you can see is this first wave looks like it has a lot fewer cases. But if you look at deaths, that's not the case. There were actually more deaths in the first wave and it suggests that there were probably more infections. When we look at wastewater that bears out, this concentration here um, is much higher. It peaks out at much higher for the wastewater data than it does for the testing data, indicating there was a lot more infection in New Haven early on than we knew about. We got testing programs ramped up later on, but wastewater was able to catch what the weak and limited testing programs early on in the pandemic were not able to catch. We have a dashboard now where we monitor this stuff continually in Connecticut. Um, so we, we take samples from about a uh, wastewater treatment plants in the major cities. They serve about a million people and we get that data each day and we put it out on the web and we track it. Um, this is an older shot right now, but um, concentrations are all very low now. They're all kind of in this bottom range here. And it's important, especially important that we continue to do this in the event that there are any outbreaks that happen. We don't expect much over the summer, but we expect outbreaks probably in the fall again, much smaller because of a large vaccination po population, but we expect outbreaks. But of course, Connecticut um, is not the problem or the United States or, or, or many of the developed countries in the world that have nice vaccine coverage, it's the developing world right now that's going to be the problem. It's going to be places that have limited vaccination coverage. We expect COVID to be around for a long, long time. We expect COVID outbreaks in many places in the world to be strong next year. And we'd like to export this type of um, knowledge to those other countries so you can efficiently do this. 
the cost of testing wastewater, one of these samples, is roughly the cost of testing one person. So in New Haven, Connecticut, we can test uh, the whole city for 200 for uh, 200,000 people for about $30. And that's about as much as it costs to test the whole population. If we look more broadly about it, um, I think many people have been lulled into this idea that we always test for respiratory diseases. But if you think about it, when's the last time you had a cold or maybe you had the flu even, and you went to a physician and you got diagnosed with something, but they actually took a sample and did a PCR test at a lab and then gave you those PCR test results back. I'm wagering to say never for most people, or if it has been a few people, it's been very rare. We don't monitor infectious diseases that way. We don't have confirmation of what's going on. In the United States, we have more than a billion infectious diseases a year. That's three, or I'm sorry, respiratory diseases a year. That's, that's, that's more than three infections for most people. For children, it can be five to eight infections a year, right? Juxtapose that billion versus about 10,000 infectious diseases from water contamination each year. We have no idea what the agents are of those diseases. We don't track them. And um, you know, it's a, it's a big blind spot in our epidemiology. And so you know, if we just go into wastewater and we just sequence everything and we start pulling out of the different viruses, these are all the different types of viruses that you could see. And you can see that there's a diversity of viruses in wastewater, not just coronaviruses. And it suggests that we could uh, monitor many, many different infectious diseases, even things like HIV, rhinovirus, for example, for colds, et cetera, by looking into wastewater. So we're moving forward with trying to build up epidemiology to now start to consider all the different respiratory diseases that we have. I think before COVID, respiratory diseases were taken as a matter of course, just a nuisance. You had to deal through it. You had to plow through these things. Um, we're developing technology, I think, right now that that's going to change. Um, 200 years ago, that was the same situation with drinking water. And we hope that we can take some of those lessons that were used in drinking water and wastewater that were developed largely by environmental engineers to treat um, uh, to, to treat uh, water and use that to treat air, to design buildings, to do all kinds of interventions so that these respiratory diseases, I don't think they're ever going to be a thing of the past, but can be reduced dramatically. All right, so I want to shift gears a little bit away from SARS and think about just about growing up and living in a building is something that we all do. And let's talk about a different disease. This time, let's talk about allergies and respiratory disease like asthma. So one in five children in the United States um, have respiratory al allergies, uh, have some sort of allergies. One in 10 has asthma. And in the US, the rates of asthma have doubled. 50% of Americans are sensitized to some type of allergen. We have food air, um, latex, you name it. And this number, but this number is only 7% among certain populations in the United States. The Amish community uh, in Indiana is a, a, a religious community that doesn't use any sort of mechanized um, equipment. They don't have cars or anything like that. They live in close proximity with animals on farms. And so, you know, we have these always built in experiments in our societies where one group may have a high, high incidence of disease and another group may have a low incidence of disease. So that's some clue in figuring out um, where asthma is coming from. In China, of course, asthma prevalence is growing very rapidly. It's up to six times greater in urban areas versus rural areas for children. So another clue about what is it about urban areas that is so important for asthma. So this is, uh, many of you recognize this is Hong Kong. I would guess you know, nobody would doubt that this is what an urban area looks like. This is a very different environment than Bavaria, which is in Germany. This is an agricultural region in Germany. And the reason I show you this picture, and we'll get into this in a little bit more detail, is that um, this is very rural, and the children and, and adults who live in this area have almost zero asthma and allergies. The rates are um, off the charts in the negative direction, that is. It's just almost unheard of for children to have asthma um, when they grow up in this region. One thing that they do very differently than most of us, I would wager, is that they live in houses that are in very close proximity to their animals. So here they have cattle. 
Their houses up here in the living quarters are on top in the brown area. These white areas are barns. And so the cattle live right directly below them in the same building as they do. When people have looked at this uh, and studied in epidemiology studies, this is what we call a graph of odds ratios. This is just a way of saying, are your odds greater of having a disease or less of having a disease? And in this case, when things are pointing to the left of this dot dashed line, that means that you're protected from a disease. And children who grew up in Bavaria, right? Um, and that lived in one of these farmhouses before the year, before uh, uh, year one, that is, they were born there and they lived there there early, have almost a 10 times lower chance of getting asthma and are on five times lower chance of something called eight atopy, which is a propensity for developing allergic disease. That's versus the same population, the same genetics of, of children who live very nearby, but um, may have even lived in the region, but have never lived in one of these farmhouses and certainly didn't do, do so in the first year of their lives, right? So there's something about being, uh, uh, being born and spending your first year of life in one of these farmhouses that gives you this tremendous protection against asthma. And of course, the idea is that it's animals. Well, what is it about animals that secretly confers this? Along these lines, we would participate in epidemiology studies. This is with the California Department of Health, and this is a cohort of asthmatic children called Chimacos that um, was followed from birth. Pregnant women were enrolled in California and they were followed through the age of 12, where they were, we knew the conditions in which the homes lived, the children lived in in the first year. And we knew what kind of diagnosis they got for asthma or allergies um, all the way through age 12. And when we did that, and we did the epidemiology, we looked at the microbial populations that lived in the homes, one thing stood out really dramatically, and that was fungi. The children who did not develop asthma were exposed to a large diversity of fungi, right? And so I'm showing you plates of fungi here because this is just a better way to look at it. But of course, what you are exposed to in your home don't look like this unless they're growing on your walls, which isn't a good thing. It's the small microscopic spores that grow in these sort of bodies, right? There are millions and millions of these in each in each person's homes. One gram of your carpet dust contains millions to potentially billions of spores of um, these types of fungi. But it's not so much the fact that you're exposed to a lot of them or a little of them, it's that you're exposed to many different kinds. And the more different kinds you're exposed to seems to have a strong protective effect. Now we get at that through biotechnology. That is by taking dust samples, sequencing their DNA, looking through that DNA and identifying the different varieties of fungi. That's something we could never get through by plating because while this looks like it, there's a real diverse group of fungi and it's all pretty interesting in a house, this is what? One, two, three, four, five, one, three. This is 20 different uh, species. In a, in a gram of, of dust, we'll see thousands of different species when we actually sequence them. All right, so this is what the odds ratios look like that. This is our study called the Chimaco study. And you had roughly a five time protective effect if you had a high diversity uh, of fungi in your house of not developing asthma. That is for high fungal diversity in your home, you are five times less likely to develop asthma than you are if you have low fungal diversity in your home. This was um, confirmed in another epi study uh, recently in the United States and in two other epidemiology studies in, uh, in, um, in Europe. So now it's, it's four out of four, say that there's something important about fungal diversity. The hypotheses for these types of things have been put forward and it's that uh, microbial richness results in diversity of something called PAMPs. These are pathogen associated microbial uh, patterns. That is just the type of biochemical signature that's on the outside of different microbes. When a child is exposed to those early on in life as their immune system is developing, the immune system develops to recognize those types of microorganisms. Um, if they don't have a diversity of recognition, the immune system is poorly trained, and that results in this cascade that causes allergies and asthma. Other associated hypotheses, again, happen with a gut microbiome, um, that um, you, your gut microbiome needs to be trained 
by specific types of microorganisms, not just the patterns, but maybe microbes that do things within your gut. You have to be seeded in a proper way. You need a lot of microbial diversity in order to have that happen early on in life. And if you don't get enough bacterial and fungal richness, that is, or diversity early on, you have a problem. So how do you get exposure to more microbial diversity early on in life? This is the dog, right? How did those children in Bavaria get that microbial exposure? I can't say whether they have dogs or not. I'm assuming they probably have dogs, but it's the cattle, right? They grow up around cattle, they grow around pigs and other type of livestock. The microbial diversity in those homes in Bavaria is very high. If you look at the microbial diversity in homes in Connecticut, and I would wager in China as well, and you compare homes with dogs versus homes without dogs, you'll find much higher microbial diversity in homes with dogs. In fact, when we just look at Connecticut and we look at just a survey, this is over 200 homes in our state. These are fungi, bacteria, human cells, and dog cells, right? And this is just a, a kind of a cumulative probability of, of what these concentrations are. About half the homes have dogs, so we don't see any dog cells in homes that don't have dogs. But some of these homes have, you know, 10,000 dog cells per gram of dust. They're, they're pretty heavily covered with dogs. In fact, over and over, when you look at microbial diversity, even things like scraping off the dust from your TV screen, if you have a dog, you can look at the signatures of those microbial communities and you can tell a dog lives in that house. The one thing that really tends to move the dial on the microbial diversity in a house is living with dogs. There's another thing that tends to move that dial as well, and that's mold growing in your house. And unfortunately, mold moves the dial the other way. Mold, fungi diversity, good. Fungi growing on your walls, bad, that is, right? Because that turns to lower diversity. This is a large problem um, throughout the world because as we have problems with climate change, we continue to get these large flooding events. Um, we continue to get hotter days, more moisture um, that results in fungi growing in building materials in our homes. Up to 50% of homes in the United States have reported some sort of mold growing in their house. And if we look at things like record-breaking daily rainfalls, which contribute to dampness and moisture in house, that's just increasing with increased energy and moisture in the atmosphere due to climate. We did an experimental design where we looked at a national study. We wanted to know more about mold in houses. And so we did the same sort of uh, DNA sequencing approach where we took dust from different houses. We sequenced it. We identified all the fungi based on the genes associated with individual um, unique fungi. And then we put together what the populations look like in homes from around the United States. We looked at homes that had documented mold problems, and we looked at homes that had no documentation of mold problems to see if there's a difference really between a moldy home and a non-moldy home. And the reason why you'd, that's the question is because, you know, when mold occurs in a home, it might be under a sink, it might be mold growing in a closet, it might be mold growing in the basement. And the question is in these living areas and children's bedrooms or the most common areas in the house, do we see an influence of that mold that grows in those building materials? And the first thing that we see is that there is a big influence and it influences this diversity. So this is just a technical term that we have to put in you know, for scientific journals. They don't wanna see the term diversity here. This is observed ASV count. ASV is just a way of kind of saying species here. And it's the higher the count, the more diversity or the more different types of fungi exist in a home. This is if you just look at direct mold, just add some mold growing on a wall, and you can say that's a relatively diverse thing. There's a few different species to actually technically, typically growing there. If you look at the air of a moldy home, though, it looks kind of like direct mold, very low diversity. When you go to a home that doesn't have mold or no history of mold, you see a range of diversities, but on average, that diversity is much higher, and it looks a lot like the diversity that you would get from outside. When we put these together and we sequence everything, um, you end up with hundreds or thousands of samples, each with tens of thousands of identifications in them. And we wanted to use all of this information to put it together to see if we could classify based on a DNA sequence test, whether a house had a mold problem or not, whether it was uh, the mold signature made it look like a moldy house or not. Because a lot of times there are health problems in homes and there are no obvious mold growth there because 
homes based on surface area are mostly hidden spaces. That is the spaces that you can see in your home are the minority of spaces. Mold grows inside the walls, under the floor, um, in floorboards, in ceilings, in ventilation systems. And so um, mold inspection can often elude people and it's a large multi-billion dollar problem and an industry that has no tools to really go in, sample the air and say, yes, you have a mold problem. So we put all this data together, we put them into things like decision trees, which is a basis of a, of a machine learning algorithm, in this case, a random forest model. And we just ask questions, right? Here's some moldy houses, here's some no moldy houses. What about the Aspergillus, the species of mold? It's a concentration high in these houses. Um, some are no, some are yes. It turns out it's typically high in a moldy house. What about Malassezia? This is a human skin. Turns out it's typically higher in no mold houses because the other mold from from moldy houses is crowding it out, right? You can just ask this for species after species, for microbial condition after microbial condition. You can do this a thousand times. You can do this for many, many different buildings and you get this, not one single decision tree, you get what's called a random forest. And that random forest can take this very broad um, group of sequence information from a lot of diverse homes and it can make some sense out of it and build a classification system. You can train this classification system saying, this is what we want moldy houses to look like. This is what we want no mold houses to look like. And you can see, um, you know, you got a way of predicting it. That is um, houses that um, are moldy, we predict in this case about 95% of the time. Houses that are not moldy, same thing. Um, this is based on how many different houses. Anything to the left here is an incorrect prediction. Same thing here, anything to the right is a correct prediction. So again, we're above 90% in being able to predict it. So this is a tool that's been patented, is now going through product development, and that we're hoping that we can get in homes um, fairly rapidly. The idea again is that an inspector would just need to come in, take a Q-tip and swap some settled dust. That would just be sent to his lab, sequenced overnight, put into the algorithm, and then you could say that this home has got characteristics of mold problem. You need remediation or you don't remediation. So I'm going to um, end here with two big questions about environmental biotechnology and our human health. And the first one is about wastewater surveillance. Can that be a standard epidemiological tool for the broad survey of infectious disease? And so we're not just talking about, can we add another tool? to our survey of infectious disease, we're acting, actually asking, can we start to really accurately survey infectious disease for the first time, right? Some diseases have better surveys than others, but mostly we, we ignore this problem. We don't have good ideas when outbreak occurs for many different types of agents. And so we're gonna ask the question and we're gonna continue on with this work of how we can develop this for flu, for HIV, for many, many diseases, things like Lyme disease in Connecticut, to get a good idea when these seasons are, when they occur, what the cases levels are. We think this could be a tremendous attribute to public health. The second idea here then is, how can we intentionally design buildings to control human exposure to hazardous as well as beneficial microbes? If microbial diversity is good for us, how can we design homes to um, encourage microbial diversity so our children don't develop immune system diseases like asthma and allergies. Um, getting a dog is one thing, but of course that's not really a home design. That's more of a personal decision. How can we encourage better ventilation? How can we encourage more outdoor air, especially in mega cities throughout the world that have air pollution problems and ventilation isn't as easy as it is in other more rural areas of the country. So those are the problems that we continue to work on. Um, I thank you very much for your attention and I'll leave it there. Thank you so much. That was a most fascinating uh, presentation. Uh, and we could go into you know so many of those different uh, ideas and really explore them. Um, I'm gonna open it up now for questions from the audience. So if anybody has questions, please feel free to um, raise your hand uh, using the the Zoom uh, raise your hand function, um, or you can type out your question in the chat box. Um, either way, I, I'd be uh, more than happy to call on people um, so that you guys can ask the uh, questions that you have directly. Um, and I'm sure there are many fascinating 
conversations that we can be having. So uh, if you have any questions, feel free to uh, raise your hand or um, use the chat box. And again, um, especially if you're asking a question, it'd be great if you could turn on your webcam just so we could know who we're talking to. All right, let's start with Maggie here. I'm going to unmute you. Hi, um, so I have a question about the process of your study. So um, what is the most difficult problem of your, for your team in the process of quantitative detection of like such amount of small microorganisms in the sewage? Um, it's a good, it's a really good question, Maggie. So you're asking about um, the microorganisms in sewage are low concentrations and this must be difficult to detect. And it turns out it is. When you go to get a COVID test and they take a swab of your nose, the concentrations, if you're positive, of COVID in that swab are more than a million times greater than the concentrations in wastewater. Uh, so they are very low concentrations. But we use, uh, we use an approach called um, quantitative PCR, another one called droplet digital PCR. These are methods um, that can actually detect just one gene in an environmental sample. Practically, that's a hard thing to do, but there are extraordinarily se sensitive methods. Something like one times 10 to the negative 15th or 18th grams of material can be detected in these methods pretty accurately. So um, we have a capability of getting low detection. We can detect just a few sort of uh, COVID sequences if they're available in our wastewater. The trick to making that happen is to extract the nucleic acid, the RNA from wastewater in a very careful way such that it's cleaned up. And so um, we have moved from using all kinds of different rigorous extraction techniques to using robots now to extract our RNA. It does it in a very common way and, and um, we, get, we get high concentrations, high enough to detect. So. It's trickier in wastewater because there's inhibitory compounds that mess up all that PCR reaction, but it's possible to do. So it's quite accurate. So there won't be that much errors, right? Yeah, it's accurate. And, and you, know, uh, you know, you have to be a little philosophical about accurate, what accurate means. I would say that it's not accurate. I would say it's precise. That is that it's repeatable. So, you know, if we go in and, and we want to detect the concentration of, of COVID in a, in a room in the air or in the wastewater of any pathogen in water, for example, and we get the answer that it's 100 pathogens per milliliter of water, for example, right? You know, the real answer may be that it's 10,000, but we don't really care as long as we're consistent, right? because what we care about is seeing the increases and the decreases. And as long as we can see those increases and decreases and that our data correlates strongly with the health effects, that's the basis of saying that it's accurate or not. Um, ever getting to a true concentration in an environmental sample where you have all these extractions and all these processes to quantify uh, is, is um, kind of a recipe for being depressed about how poor our analytical methods are. <laughs> so we just want to be precise. We want to, we want to measure rises and falls. We want to always pin the data to a health metric. And if we can do that, we feel good about it. Okay. Great. That's, that's amazing. So I'm just going to piggyback off that question real quick and sort of discuss a little bit more um, about the sort of process that you came with developing um, the COVID testing? And is, I mean, is this, it sounds like we could have done this for a lot of diseases, but we really haven't done this. Is that, would that be true? And sort of, could you talk a little bit more about sort of the history of using um, wastewater sure. as a way to detect diseases? Yeah, so, so certainly we didn't, you know, I don't, you know, I, I think it's kind of like, you know, New Haven likes to say they invented the hamburger, right? And uh, you know, if, if you said, well, I'm the first person who decided to use wastewater to look at infectious disease, you know, <laughs> that's a pretty basic idea that may not be attributable to one person. But I will say the early history of it is 
we've always, always cared about pathogens in wastewater, but that's mostly been because that wastewater gets into our drinking water at some point. So we've always been careful to quantify that. To actually use pathogen levels in wastewater for epidemiology, just go back to polio surveillance, and that's where it's most commonly been used. And there have been programs from the World Health Organization, the Gates Foundation have done this. Um, the country of Israel had a polio surveillance program as well. The idea being, if you want to truly eradicate it, there are a few places around the earth world that uh, there are still polio problems. If you can get in and sample collective waste every now and then, you might be able to detect when outbreaks occur. And this has been actually successful. But, it, but the science um, really got developed and uh, more attention paid to it during COVID, right? So I, I think this is more of a beginning of a science than um, it was in a very nascent stage with polio. Great, that's, uh, that's amazing. Uh, we've got another question here from uh, Gib, I believe. Sorry if I mispronounced your name. Uh, you're correct. Hi, I'm uh, Gib Parrish. I actually live in Yarmouth, Maine, so I'm in the United States. And we've actually had conducted wastewater testing too for COVID-19, for SARS-CoV-2 mm -hmm. uh, for roughly the last six months. And um, we're a much smaller place than New Haven is. And so the correlation that we've had between wastewater uh, SARS-CoV-2 concentrations and the cases in our particular town is a little less um, good than yours has been. Uh, the question I have is your big question related to wastewater testing. And um, in order to do it at scale in a lot of places over time, uh, one has to keep the cost of doing it down and it has to be actually quite mm, easy to do. Um, in our particular case, we have to pay roughly $400 per sample to obtain our result. And I know of other towns and cities where the cost may approach $1,000 per sample. And uh, it also would help if in fact the testing can be done in in the place where the wastewater is, as opposed to having to send it somewhere because that provides a faster turnaround. So I'm, I guess I'm wondering, you said your costs are about $30 per sample, which I think is remarkably low. And I don't know if that is including the infrastructure necessary to in fact set up the system to be able to do that on an ongoing basis where you are. I mean, how, how do you sort of deal with the, um, practicality of this if you yeah. wanted to try to scale up like you're talking about. Yeah, that, that's that's a really good question. And first, I wanted just to mention, you talked about correlations. Um, that sounds right to me what you said. Um, when you when you work in a large city like New Haven or Hartford, Hartford's 300,000 people in one plant, things tend to blend together. And you, you don't really, the if you just look at the curve of the cases, there are no individual outbreaks. They all just blend together um, into one smooth curve. And that tends to be reflected in the wastewater as well. Um, so everything smooths out and you get nice correlations. Now, the opposite side of that, we've worked with the town of Norwich. Um, Norwich, Norwich has 22,000 people. And uh, so it's, it's quite a bit smaller, um, still not small by many standards. And, you can see almost outbreaks of maybe individual families or early on you could hear about an outbreak in the school and we could see that in the cases. We also see that in the wastewater. And so what you see is a collection of outbreaks maybe with gaps in between, both in the wastewater as well as in the testing data. And so the smaller you get, the harder it is to accurately predict these things. So I just wanna say I agree with you on that. And I think that's a limitation in smaller towns. Um, for the testing, you know, I, I would say a few things about the prices of testing. One thing is, is, is we've tested different ways. Um, we've tested with auto samplers going into treatment plants and things like that. That infrastructure tends to be expensive and that takes a very large sample. And when you take a large sample, you have to reduce that volume down. And that's another intensive thing to do in a lab and it's inefficient. You just can never concentrate viruses with a high efficiency. It's a hard thing to do. 
Um, what we did instead is we've taken something called the primary sludge in a wastewater treatment plant. So when wastewater goes into a plant, the first step is to settle out the solid material. We then get a sample of that solid material. It's about four hours later than the primary, so we lose four hours of time. But that solid material has about 100 times higher concentration. And we don't have to do any concentration steps. And so instead of working with 100 milliliters or even 10 or 50, or in some cases, two liters of water where people have to extract it down, we just take a one milliliter sample, somewhere between 0.5 and two milliliters, depending on our assay. But let's just call it one milliliter for, for uh, and we, we do that. When you take one milliliter sample, then a lot of things are available to you. These off-the-shelf extraction kits are available to you that are commercially available. And you can run these in parallel and you can run many of them quite rapidly. Um, the types of machines that have been used for clinical testing um, to extract RNA and to do this in a high throughput from swabs, that can also be used if you have just a small volume like one milliliter to extract. And so we've moved into these RNA extraction robots as well. Um, the RNA extraction robots are, are not cheap, but I, I'm, I think that there's going to be a big influx on the market here pretty soon because a lot of places bought them for clinical testing and now are going to probably want to get rid of them. They're, they're fifty dollars to $100,000 for something like that. So hard for a small town, but not outside of the realm of a, of a grant for a wastewater utility. Um, so it really runs, comes down to um, you know, reducing the time it takes for the RNA extraction. PCR is a, is, a, is a common thing. It is done in some wastewater utilities, but only big ones. And I, I would say in the future, I could see that an extraction robot in PCR equipment could be put in a lot of wastewater labs. A lot of our work you know, had initially been supervised by postdocs and grad students, but now we have a team of undergraduates doing all of this work. Um, so, I mean, they're smart, but I'm just saying that the technical and the ex experience is not huge in doing something like this. So that's where we arrive at that value of around $30. I think that um, if we put everything into it and we included, you know, uh, an advertised um, cost of equipment and things like that, it would get to $60, $70 or something like that altogether, but still a relatively low cost. Um, so I think it's possible to do. Um, the one thing I would say about treatment plants is I've worked with treatment plants for a long time. Um, I don't know if they're too keen on doing this or not. Um, folks that work at wastewater treatment plants are always just, they're not like the nicest people in the world. And they typically have, um, you know, a real desire to do good and, and to, to and benefit the environment in many different ways. But it's a regulatory driven business in the United States for sure. And they're trying to meet regulations that are constantly changing and infrastructure is expensive to do that. If you put another task on top of that, that they now have to also monitor infectious disease for that community, I just don't know how they would react to it. They may like it because it could be an influx of money and resources and another thing that they can do beneficially. But they also may say, look, you know, we, we're supposed to clean the wastewater, not to run this complicated lab and put out epidemiology data. So I guess I would say, you know, from my perspective, if that is going to go to treatment plants, I think it's technically feasible, but there's going to have to be a change in the mandate of treatment plants to, to, want, to, to, to want to do this. Great. Thank you. Um, and for, for those of us that are not as familiar with wastewater treatment plants, um, sure, could sorry. you sort of talk about um, sort of, at least in the U.S., is, is, are they public? Are they private? How, how is the funding? And, um, and then another question that I think um, that is related to the discussion is, of course, a lot of people here are from China. And so, you know, we're talking about uh, Yarmouth, Maine, with the population of 8,000 and New Haven with the population of 200,000. But you know, we're, we're, we're talking to people in Beijing and Shanghai who have a population of over 20 million, right? So, so how scalable um, are we talking about these uh, when we're talking about these solutions? Sure. So 
so the first the first thing I'll get I'll talk about scalable first. I think that they are scalable. Um, when you get down to eight thousand, I think it might be a little tricky. I'm not sure. I'm not sure how low you can go. Um, you can certainly detect disease. Whether you can get a nice smooth curve might be a little difficult. But the reason you're not getting a smooth curve is because the shedding of virus is not smooth and the infections are not smooth. So you're still mapping reality. It's just our eyes like to go to a smooth epidemiology curve, even though it isn't in smaller populations. So I think you could do that well. And um, you know, the model we have to predict cases and predict infections ba based on wastewater scales for all sizes of treatment plants. Um, when you get to a mega treatment plant, like covering a million people, I think you might have trouble. I think you might because it's just so hard to move the dial on something like that. And so I don't have much experience with anything over 300,000, but I have colleagues who have tried to sample in treatment plants that cover something like a million people. And I have not seen a lot of success there. And I don't know the reasons why. Theoretically, I think it should work, but um, they get bigger, they get more complicated. So that's, that's one thing. But I think it should scale. And theoretically, everything should scale. The private public thing is an interesting, is an interesting question. And um, you know, we used to call wastewater treatment plants POTW, publicly owned treatment works. But they, of course, don't call that anymore because uh, within the United States, where I'm most familiar, but around the world, um, companies have arisen and said, you know, we'll, we'll take that treatment plant off your hands. They've said this to municipalities. We'll manage it, kind of like, kind of like what's happened with prisons. We can manage it for a lower cost, and we can make a profit for our company, and uh, we'll meet all your requirements, so we'll just do that. That's happened in many places, and it's more common in certain communities than other communities and other states, whatever. At least three of the treatment plants in our system are managed by private companies, but it's the city that really you know, oversees all of that. Um, the reason I mentioned that that's a really interesting part of it is because in addition to being managed by a company, a lot of other companies have looked at wastewater treatment plants and said, there is money to be made here and you guys are just throwing it away, right? You're leaving it on the table. So we, you know, treatment plants have made methane in anaerobic digesters forever, right? But up until about 10 years ago, something like 7% of treatment plants actually used that methane. They said it's expensive. Um, there isn't much of an energy crisis. Um, it has to be cleaned. Nobody wants it. You know, we can maybe, it's just easier just to light a match and burn it off right? One less trouble we have to deal with. Outdoor co outside companies now have said, well, okay, here's the deal. If we pay you, if we take over your digester and run it, right, can we have the methane, right? And that's working in a lot of different places. I was just in another plant in Danbury, Connecticut, where something called fog, fats, oils, and greases has always been a problem in sewers and treatment plants. And an outside company said, okay, we'll take your fog problem. We'll solve it, we'll collect all of it, and we'll make biodiesel out of it. And again, we'll pay you for the fog. So I don't see why, uh, if there is money there, a private company couldn't come in and monitor wastewater for pathogens as well. But I think that might have to be what it is. Or there has to be some dedication to public health monitoring in the United States or abroad that we haven't typically seen in the past. I, I would be most fascinated to see if any of the audience members here, we have a lot of students and we have a lot of business people, if they run off with, you know, some idea that you just sure. talked about and just to go with it for the future, that'd be amazing. Um, uh, Give asked if there's a published paper that describes your use of sludge uh, as a sample for viral testing. Uh, there is, there is. Um, uh, Give if you go to, I, I can put it in the chat here too. Um, well, just, there's three words you should just Google. Yale COVID wastewater. And that'll take you to a wastewater site. And that will take you to some protocols. And it will also take you to um, information on a monitoring system. And um, for anything that isn't updated there or you don't find, 
feel free to email me and my email is available on that Yale COVID site or just Google my name, it's not hard to find it. And I'm happy to share that stuff. Um, and you already touched on this, but somebody else in the chat asked if you need to separate the liquid and suspend solids to detect pathogens. But I guess more broadly, could you just very briefly talk about the actual process of, of testing um, wastewater and sort of how that even worked? Yeah. So the way that we test it is that we use this primary sludge. And again, primary sludge is, you know, the brown chunky water, wastewater goes into a treatment plant. And the first thing you do, it's not complicated, is that you put it into a big tank called a clarifier. It's, these are these big round tanks that everyone's seen in a wastewater treatment plant, or if you look at a plan, right? And that clarifier slows down the flow and it lets whatever's gonna settle by gravity, settle by gravity. That stuff that's settled by gravity is called primary sludge. And um, that gets pumped out. And when it gets pumped out, that's the sample we collect. That doesn't look like wastewater. That looks like, looks like gravy. It looks like black, chunky gravy. It's thick. And um, it's pretty awful, but it has a very high concentration. The sludge is where things, you know, microbes, chemicals, tend to migrate towards surfaces, and the largest amount is in that sludge, right? And so that's what we sample. Now, we don't sample that. The treatment plants have volunteered to provide that for us. And so they provide that every day. Um, somebody goes out, takes a primary sludge sample, throws it into the freezer, and we have a courier come and pick that up. We get deliveries then in our lab, and um, we start extracting. And so our extracting protocol right now it's evolved over time, it's pretty quick. It used to take us almost eight hours to extract the stuff to make it clean and perfect now. Now it takes about an hour and a half. And the way that we do that is um, we put it in a tube, we put some beads in there, we put some chemicals to disrupt the cell walls, we shake it, um, we let all the solid stuff and the beads settle and the stuff on top of it called supernatant um, we put that into uh, the influent of a thing called a kingfisher. That's a, it's a robot that just has each sample in a plate, and uh, we extract the RNA that way. What the robot does, it takes about 30 minutes to run, it's all hands off, is that it has a series of magnetic beads. And these beads are mixed with the sludge sample. They have a high affinity for anything for a magnet, but they also have a high affinity for RNA and DNA. And so these beads bind with the RNA and DNA just through a automated mixing sample. The robot drops these magnets into each channel or each sort of sample. We do 24 at a time. It picks up the beads, it holds on to them, and it just dunks them. It dunks them in a wash solution, it dunks them in ethanol, it dumps them in a bunch of different things to get them absolutely clean. And at the end of this, um, about 30 minutes later, you end up with some magnets that have beads on them. And these beads have pure RNA and DNA from your sample. Those are just diluted and we take it to a PCR machine from there. It, it takes less than a day to do all of the work. And um, we have slacked off on it now because cases are low. And so we're reporting just a few times a week um, right now, but we still do you know, samples every day. We collect samples every day. But prior to that, we were reporting three, four times a week during the pandemic. We were lucky to be really integrated with the Department of Health in Connecticut. We worked with the Commissioner of Health and the state epidemiologists. We were really part of their, um, their team that looked on surveillance. Um, and that was important because as outbreaks occurred, Etc. We could typically see that before they could see it with the testing data. Wonderful, thanks. That that was. I mean, clearly, it's uh, you know, you make it sound so easy, but it, I mean, I'm sure it, it it involves a lot of technology and a lot of science and a lot of people who have worked on that. Well, so we are we are working on a paper, and the title in my head is "Wastewater Surveillance is Easy." I, I think we can. <laughs> I mean, it's a bit tongue in cheek, but I think we have to make it easy if we want to do this. And I think we can, you know, anything can be made easy if you care about it. And, uh, you know, look how difficult it was to test at the beginning of this pandemic. And now 
that stuff is just getting thrown around and you know, they're begging people to get tested. So it can be made easier. Uh, I think this is a perfect segue into uh, Tech and Yao's question. I'm gonna ask you to unmute if you want to ask the question yourself, um, but if not, I can also ask for you. Um, basically the question is, um, you know, uh, we've been talking about the U.S., but again, we have a very international audience. So yeah, are there yeah. plans or is there any kind of discussion with other entities around the world to expand to other countries where COVID cases are still spiking uh, and and how we can obtain um, more samples easily? Yeah, that's that's a that's a great question. That's something that we have not done well in our lab. And, and um, I'll offer up as an excuse is that, you know, we were just a bit overwhelmed during, especially during the pandemic to keep up with all of this stuff. Um, but of course we know, and uh, we know that the COVID's not going anywhere and that it's moved more to developing countries. And as we start seeing um, uh, flu and cold season come around in many of those countries, we're gonna see continued outbreaks. It's gonna be with us for a long time because vaccines are going to take a long time to get to those countries. We have made inroads with um, with with some groups in in Pakistan, um, a little bit in India as well, but nothing you know on our side that has been um, that has been really thorough and integrated. Our goal is uh, thus far has been to try and make it easier and easier to do and possible to do so that other countries could indeed do it. Um, but uh, I, I think the, the question is a good one and it's opened up a, uh, an open spot or a blind spot. We have to get better at monitoring in other countries, not just for COVID, but for probably a lot of diseases. Right. Yeah, and I'm sure, and like you said, this is sort of potentially the beginning of a new kind of trend in, in how we're doing things. So hopefully yeah. we see more of that. Uh, you know, Maggie? We, I'll, I'll say we, we tried to do this early on in the pandemic and, and NIH said they wouldn't fund anything internationally. <laughs> so we, we can blame it on them. <laughs> All right, uh, Maggie had another question. Um, hi, so I have a question about, can you use this method of um, detecting COVID disease to detect like illness drug use and maybe if because for COVID you can detect their RNA so maybe if you can detect like illness drug use you can also detect the criminal's DNA that would be easier for like um, the police and staff to search for these criminal actions and stuff. Sure. So we certainly can detect drugs in, the, in wastewater using this technique. It's just a different analytical technique at the end of it. It's not PCR, it's you know, gas chromatography, mass spectrometry. Um, we have done that in our New Haven samples. Um, not so much to try and catch criminals, but to understand what the effects of the lockdowns were. And so I didn't show that data because I wanted to be more brief about things today. But um, you can learn a lot from that type of data. So we looked at, for example, um, the use of opioid drugs. And we found that during the lockdown in Connecticut, the use of opioid drugs increased, right? Except for the opioid drugs that were used in hospitals and those decreased because they weren't doing elective surgeries. Um, we found that uh, antidepressant drugs increased um, during the, the epidemic as well. We found that things like the use of sunscreen increased um, because more people were out hiking. We found that chemicals that are associated with anti-corrosion inhibitors and brakes for cars decreased during the initial lockdown because there were fewer cars on the road. And I just put those out there as there are many, many different things we could learn about society by interrogating wastewater through chemicals. Um, so yes, absolutely. And there is more of a history of looking at chemicals in wastewater than there has been of pathogens in the past. So that's a better developed science. Um, 
I would note though, you know, when you're talking about trying to catch criminals or looking at their DNA, I don't know how we would do that. And I don't think that wastewater treatment plants, you know, getting them to, to look for infectious disease is one thing, getting them into law enforcement might be a little bit different. Um, but I would say it's an interesting topic you bring up about looking at human DNA and more specifically about RNA, because we know that, um, again, we have this, this stream of tens of thousands of people that can be tested, and we can look at genes that get we know get overexpressed in heart disease or diabetes or other types of human health conditions. And we might be able to say more about the community by looking at human metabolites as well as human gene expression in wastewater. Um, then again, we can see from, we might be able to get new insights on a population level that is. Um, that's, that's a ways off of figuring out how to do that, but I think that there's potential there. Um, great. So we've talked a lot about wastewater. Um, but there's a whole second half of your presentation, uh, which was about asthma and allergens, which I, th I found just as fascinating. Um, so I'm going to say last call for questions for people who have questions about anything. Um, and then in the meantime, uh, I do want to talk about allergens and asthma because um, that is so prevalent. Um, uh, so, so I think you talked more about the impact on asthma specifically. Um, what's the connection with allergens? I, I know there's a lot of overlap with asthma and allergies, um, but yeah, you, about that? you know, so I would say a long time ago, traditionally, and it's, it's still kind of the dogma in the minds of a lot of people, not people who really know a lot about this, but that asthma and allergies are kind of related, right? Um, allergies, uh, asthma is, is inflammation, inflammation in your airways. And there was always an idea that that was related to allergies. And it turns out that there is a type of asthma that's related to allergies. It's, they roughly call it atopic asthma or allergic asthma. And that was often thought to be the most dominant type, but there are other types of asthma that don't necessarily go through that allergy type pathway. And so I'm just saying asthma can be more broadly than just allergies, but there's a traditional relationship between allergens and asthma as well as, as a way to get your airways inflamed. And in that case, which is probably at least 50% of all asthma, allergens um, can, can inflame um, the condition or exacerbate the condition. Um, but what we were talking about mostly wasn't so much the severity of asthma, which is another topic we've looked into, but we were talking about just the actual development of it and the development of allergies and potentially some other immune system diseases um, based on the idea that in the first year of life, the immune system needs some training and the way that we live right now, especially in urban environments in clean homes without animals, is very different than the way that we have evolved uh, over the last you know, tens of thousands of years. And so um, it appears that you know, something that is missing is um, the divert, we're, we're increasingly exposed to a di less diverse microbial community as young children. And that there's a lot of evidence to show that that's having some impact on these immune diseases. So one way to get back into the old way is, you know, to always have an animal around you. Great. And the dog. Right. Well, I don't see any more questions and that seems as good of a note as any to, uh, to end our time together. Um, so the first uh, sort of action point everybody is to get a dog and the second is to look into investing into wastewater. <laughs> right. um, great so thank you so much uh, that was again a most fascinating conversation um, and I'm actually going to ask everybody if you're willing to one last time turn on your cameras we're going to take a group picture um, and I'm also going to unmute everybody so that you guys can all thank Professor Pechia yourselves. So thanks again everybody and have a good uh, evening for those of you in China and a good uh, rest of the day for those in the U.S. and everything in between. Thank, Thank you, you very much. much. Thank you. Thank you very much.